Okay, we might get started. Is everybody ready to go? Yeah, cool. All right. Welcome to the region. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands on which I'm calling in from today. I'm an uninvited guest from Turtle Island near the seat of, uh, site of Treaty 4, the territory of the Niawak, Anna Sinipec, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Machif nations. I came to Narm, Melbourne more than 15 years ago to the beautiful lands of the Boonarung language groups of the Eastern Kulin nations. I respectfully acknowledge elders past and present and any Indigenous peoples here with us today. We recognize First Nations connect connection to land, waters, and community, and acknowledge their significant contributions to art and culture. We invite you to put in the chat where you're calling in from today and whose traditional lands you're standing on. My name is Marnie Badham. I'm an artist researcher at CAST Research Group in the School of Art at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. CAST, Contemporary Art and Social Transformation, produces art research that critically engages with social and public spheres with a particular interest in how artistic practices intersect with issues of equity, access, and democracy. Welcome to the region, Dialogues on the Power and Precarity of Artist Self-Organization in the Asia Pacific. This international symposium is co-created by Westspace, Australia, Parasite, Hong Kong, Enjoy Contemporary Art Space, Aotearoa, and Western Front, Canada, and co-facilitated by CAST at RMIT. I've had the pleasure with my colleague Tammy Wong Hulbert at RMIT to work with these four groups to plan this symposium over a series of roundtable discussions about the most urgent issues in curating and cultural production today. It marks 20 years since West Space and 17 international peer organizations convened Space Traffic a global conference that aimed to bring together alternative art spaces from around the world to discuss, tackle, explore issues surrounding non-mainstream art and culture with a focus on the Asia Pacific region. Also a quick shout out to Sebastian Henry Jones, the symposium coordinator, Tao Nguyen, our cast coordinator, and Emilian Wallen, curator from West Space who instigated the project. These online sessions are conducted in English over Zoom with live Auslan interpretation and English closed captions. There's a little CC button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to turn that function on. And thank you to our interpreters joining us today, Linda and Jerry. The sessions will be recorded and made available later on all of our websites. We'll be using the Q&A function, so please add your comments and questions as we go, and your chair will be able to share your words and questions. We now begin with the first of five sessions, hosted today by Enjoy Contemporary Art Space. Illusions of Structural Change, Resisting the Cultural Identity of Western Institutions in Artist-Run Spaces. Your formidable chair today is Vanessa Maychowski. Vanessa is an artist, arts worker, and writer. Also a poet, I hear. She's interested in supporting the art practices of queer and Asian migrants and trauma-informed approaches to entrenching understandings of care and accessibility across creative disciplines. So again, please um, let us know where you're calling in from today, the traditional lands on which you're standing, as well as um, be as active as you can in the Q&A, reflecting on what you hear, but also posing questions. Over to you, Vanessa. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, I'm just gonna do a short mahi in te reo uh, before kicking things off. Um, so, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, kia ora inga iwi, kua hui hui mai nei uh, ki te kōrero i ngā whakaro i te rā nei. Uh, ko Vanessa Maykrofsky, tōku ingoa, kei te noho au ki te whanganoia tara, uh, 
Aotearoa. Kei enjoy contemporary art space. Aho e mahi ana he kai whakahaere taku tūranga mahi. Um, no haina, no marehia, no pōrana, no airangi, no pākehā aho. Um, so essentially what I am saying is um, welcome you all to who have gathered here um, for this conversation today. Um, which I am really looking forward to with um, uh, the wonderful speakers that we have um, who will introduce themselves a little bit later. I'm Vanessa. I am from overseas Chinese, Irish and Polish descent based in uh, Te Whanganui Atara, uh, the capital of Aotearoa. And yeah, Enjoy is a 21 year old nonprofit uh, arts organization based out of here and we are supported primarily by Creative New Zealand. Um, our mission and vision is all about supporting artists with experimental practices and uh, emerging talents to, to build rela strong relationships with. Um, before I begin the session properly, I'd just like to acknowledge the um, mana whenua and rightful custodians of the land uh, that I'm calling from, so Te Whanganui Atara, that is um, the Te Ati Awa iwi, Taranaki Whanui and the neighbouring Ngāti Toa iwi. Um, this panel session, as Mani mentioned, is called Illusions of Structural Change, Resisting the Cultural Identity of Western Institutions and Artist-Run Spaces. It is a big topic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, I think where this conversation originated from was um, actually in, in a conversation with Lana Lopisi, who is in the fourth session um, hosted by Western France around how extraordinarily lonely it can be to be um, an arts worker from a marginalized background and the pressure that many can face to make huge changes um, and feel responsible for their communities within the arts. So what we're really asking today is what, what are our collective responsibilities? What, what are we taking on that we, we maybe don't have to? What would it look like if we unchained ourselves from, from that responsibility and Kind of to who do we owe what and to what extent um, and I'm sure that my speakers will have their own individual spins on this. Uh, as mentioned before I would love if um, you had any questions we will dedicate 10 to 15 minutes at the end to answering them so pop them in the Q&A and we will go through them. Um, I think that's all for, from me for introductions. Uh, thank you all of you for joining us. It's really wonderful. Um, and I am going to ask my speakers to introduce themselves um, as the people they know best. Uh, can I start with you, Tamsin, to do a little introduction? Sure, thanks, Vanessa. Um, so before I introduce myself, I'd like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners and custodians of the land in which I'm working from and living from. Um, they're the Wandri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and also extend that to any other First Nations people listening here, and then also any other First Nations people um, in the room. Um, I'd like to extend that acknowledgement to my own ancestors in Aotearoa. Um, specifically, Aokoro Te Hapuku, who signed to the Owaitangi, and all my whānau back home, miss them a lot. Um, uh, so, kia ora koutou katoa, um, ko Haruru tuku maunga, ko Mohaka tuku awa, ko Takatimu tuku waka, ko Ngāti Kangunu tuku iwi, ko Ngāti Pahuera tuku hapu, uh, ko Tamsin Hopkinson tuku ingoa. Um, so that was my mihi in te reo, my pipiha, um, and basically it translates into English as, um, I guess, like an introduction to my mountain, my river, um, and my tribes. Um, I'm from the east coast of the North Island in Aotearoa, and I moved to Nam, Melbourne, maybe 
like 18 years ago, I think. Um, I am a Māori curator and artist. And I've worked in artist run spaces for, I guess, like the last decade, which feels like a long time, but time feels kind of messy at the moment. Um, and in my practice, I work across a lot of kind of different fields. And in my practice, I'm interested in ideas of language, um, materiality from like a te ao Māori point of view, um, accessibility and ideas of sound and archives. Um, so the artist run spaces that I've worked across have been TCB in NAM, um, West Space and Projects. And then more recently I've joined Footscray Community Arts Centre, which is quite a different space to what I'm used to working in. Um, I also taught at Monash um, as part of, yeah, I guess lots of, um, like I taught art history in, um, in the Honours Programme. Yes, yeah, so, so thank you so much for having me here. Um, I feel like this topic is really close to my heart. Um, and so, yeah, we'll do our best to like talk to it. I guess I also wanted to say that we don't, um, I'm interested in the nuance of this conversation um, and less interested in like providing any kind of answers because I don't think that's possible. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Tamsin. Um, Vanessa Kwan, could I ask you to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thanks, Vanessa. Um, yeah, um, I am coming to you from the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh people today. Um, in my case, that means uh, Vancouver, BC, Canada. Um, as always, I I um, I pay my respects to the first peoples of this place and to um, the many the ways that I'm continuing to learn about um, how to hold the world differently than, um, than we have. Um, and I think that's sort of germane to our conversation today. So I, I did a bit of thinking beforehand around like, yeah, how, how that really, the, the things that I continue to learn um, from indigenous uh, friends and colleagues and specifically from the host nations here really are about um, looking to the future differently. Um, and so, um, yeah, my name is Vanessa Kwan. You can call me VK if you'd like to distinguish me from the other esteemed Vanessa in the, in the Zoom room. Uh, my pronouns are she and they. Uh, I am uh, an artist and a curator. Um, and I guess, um, yeah, I, I'm the program director at a place called Grunt Gallery, which is uh, a space that's been open since 1984. Um, and yeah, and Tanya also has uh, had a huge impact on Grunt and uh, spent some time there as well. Um, and previous to that, I've also worked for a group called Other Sites, which is a collective um, that uh, uh, does public art, uh, art in public space. Um, I've also worked for the Vancouver Art Gallery, previously uh, the Powell Street Festival um, Access Gallery, and a few other spaces in this area. Um, and artist-run culture has been a very uh, formative part of my entire career. Um, I came to this as an artist first and uh, I hold that very, very dear as a, as a facet to my practice. Um, and I think I'm only now kind of understanding the implications of that on, on what a professional practice looks like. I think actually the, inter, the interstitial spaces between art practice and um, what we might call curatorial or administrative um, are really critical to think about alongside, alongside all the other interstitial spaces that we occupy. Um, Anyway, I will leave it at that. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you so much. It is, uh, yeah, it's a really, really real privilege to share the space with you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks VK. Um, without even jumping into it now, I think um, what you mentioned about considering your curatorial practice as part of your overall arts practice is, is really interesting and quite relevant actually. Um, I'm gonna pass over to our final um, esteemed speaker, uh, Tanya. Thank you, White Kuhaitep, request Tanya Willard, Slaka Kla Laweka, Nanisgain Esh, Nasaquatmak Utluk. So I'm just sharing an introduction in my language. So Kwatmak's Jean, I'm a learner. Um, my language is an endangered language um, with very few speakers who were born into the language. And so it's close to my heart to learn and support our community in. Uh, creating new speakers and futures. And in my case, 
our language is um, literally my future because my children learn uh, our language. Um, so it warms my heart to see to hear other language uh, and people's Indigenous languages here today. So I thank you for that. My name is Tanya Willard and I'm joining you from my home territory in Sukhwatmah And this is how we refer to our nation and territory. And it refers not only to the land, but also to our culture and language and everything that comes from the land. And this is really relevant in kind of my talk and my research interests, which are building on this concept of um, bush gallery and citation, S-I-T-E, A-T-I-O-N. It's the idea of site specificity that's grounded within indigenous territoriality uh, and seeing the, um, the bush, nature, outdoors uh, as a place of, uh, or a space for art and conversation and the aesthetics of being on the land and being in relationship to the land. Uh, and so I have a background as an artist and curator. I also teach uh, recently with UBC Okanagan, which is based in Silk territories. Uh, I think I forgot to add that one. So Silk is the neighboring nation to the Sokotmach. And uh, yeah, I, I work between all of those things. So relate to um, Vanessa in this space of considering art practice throughout uh, the ways in which I work uh, and certainly owe a lot to formative experiences at Grunt Gallery. And I'm just really excited to be here today to join uh, you all in conversation and thankful for those who are joining us and for seeing the many territories and lands that you're carrying into this virtual space. So, and also acknowledge the space of the physical kind of footprints of Zoom and the infrastructure of these things uh, that also have uh, an impact. But it's also a great benefit for me to be able to join you. I live in a rural uh, place. So um, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Kia ora, Tanya. Um, so those are our three really wonderful speakers for um, this session, which, and I think I'm going to start with a, a question about your relationship to um, Western power structures and, and Western institutions. Um, I'd love to hear from each of you about I think, I think it's interesting how we, we all sit both inside and outside of these organizations, um, but, but operate as, as ourselves and with our communities throughout. So there is a lot of um, back and forth and play. Um, so I'd be interested to hear what, what aspects of, of Western cultural identity you choose to adopt and resist. Um, first off, I'd love to ask you, Tanya, um, I, in our practice um, session, you mentioned this phrase, with diversity doesn't necessarily come power or come a way of resituating things. Could I ask you to unpack that a little bit more um, and the impetus behind Bush Gallery? Sure. Um, well, yeah, I, I think I'm speaking to what many people will be familiar with in terms of a kind of tokenism or the ways in which diversity can be popularized but can come without a sense of power. So I know that there's been some good studies um, in Canada here and Diamond is a researcher who's looked at the actual um, you know, data, based what, what data there is uh, in terms of galleries of all different types, artist run center to large, you know, multi-million dollar budget institutions and what diversity looks like, not only in their exhibition schedule, but in their collections, in their board, in their staff. And, and that picture, you know, the, especially the picture in terms of the power of being in a collection, the power of being on a board or a staff. Um, Tanya, I'll just pause. Would, could I ask you to repeat yourself? I think you've cut out a little bit earlier. Yep, sorry about that. I have uh, mentioned that I was rural. <laughs> So um, my internet may be not the most reliable, but I'm in the closest uh, internet um, epicenter I can be. 
in the town. Uh, but yeah, I'm just uh, repeating that when you look at the statistics of uh, representation and diversity in galleries, uh, first of all, it doesn't exist in the same way we might think it does in the exhibition schedule. We might see a few exhibitions here and there that have diverse artists or content and we start to think that's normalized, but actually when you break, break it down, that's not, not often the case. And then it's, um, it's even more so uh, represented within the, um, you know, within the places where power is situated. So um, curatorial, administrative, budget, um, directors, board, uh, and, and also being represented in a collection. Um, those uh, areas uh, often, at least in the Canadian sense, um, show uh, actually like quite a severe lack of diversity. Uh, when that comes to gender, um, Indigenous, um, Black, Indigenous people of colour, um, queer artists, you know, it's still not, we kind of have this like dialogue that somehow like it is being represented or, you know, this, this backlash that, um, you know, people are, but that it's somehow we still struggle with this, like the identity politic or something. Um, and in fact, it's quite clear in the data that we're still not at parity or actually even very close to it. So um, I think in my experience as an artist and curator, you know, that that's one thing, the data, but how it feels uh, is a bit, um, I think a sense of displacement, a sense of uh, trying to bring your community in, but knowing that the space is not the, the not suited to the community and these ways in which you feel push and pull uh, in these spaces and exactly as you're mentioning a kind of a responsibility to represent and to bring in or to educate um, about your culture within that structure and that can be quite um, exhausting uh, and not fulfilling you know i think that's that's the other thing it's not a very joyful place um, and i in my experiences with a range of um, different kinds of uh, artist spaces, I just felt like I was always trying to make up a, the difference, you know, trying to fit um, Indigenous artists, curatorial approaches, different methods into the gallery. And I kind of made a decision that I'm okay to do that some of the time, but I also need this outlet, which for me has become Bush Gallery, uh, which just situates that it allows me to situate things very differently so that I've defined the space of the gallery and where it's centered and other things have to fit into it, not me always trying to um, fit into, you know, the white cube, which has its uh, advantages and a whole series of drawbacks as well. So uh, I know there's probably more to say on that, but um, yeah, Bush Galleries yeah. for me is the place of uh, joy and a place of um, cultural continuity and a place of uh, inclusion and experimentation and that gives me the the sense of not being so displaced or push and pull that I'm able to kind of come together uh, in that small project um, and with that lens and it helps me carry through to when I am in that um, role within a more westernized institution and it's also not perfect just also I carry my own you know uh, whatever my own art uh, de you know ways in which I'm still consistently decolonizing and learning um, in my own uh, work and family and place yeah thank you Tanya um, and I think I think you speak to um, I, I really felt what you were saying even back here in Aotearoa around the, um, yeah, the, the difference between what is being exhibited and, and where the power actually falls uh, to be quite starkly different. And that for many who are, who are trying to make the place a, a bit more inclusive, um, that it does come with a lot of burnout um, and as mentioned before, um, a feeling of loneliness and a feeling of um, take, taking on too much responsibility sometimes. 
Um, I would also really encourage uh, VK and Tamsin if there is anything you know that um, a speaker is saying, you, you can bypass me if you want. Uh, I'd love to kind of start more of a dialogue. So if you uh, feel like jumping at any point, you're very welcome to. Um, back to Bush Gallery, as, as described in C Magazine, you, you mentioned as I was interested in how you spoke of it as a transconceptual space, uh, repositioning ideas born within Indigenous and Western epistemological conditions, um, and how you related that to the side of a, a body with a transconceptual body requiring your body to be in a constant state of flux, never settling like the flow of water in a river. Um, and that to me spoke really beautifully of how your um, how your motives and your vision uh, feel so closely aligned with with the land and with your your own physicality. Yeah, I should mention that manifesto was uh, co-written um, with uh, mm. artist Morin and uh, Gabriel Hill, who came together in a residency R E Z residency as in on the Indian Reserve. Um, and this is something we draw attention to also is both the legacy of uh, colonialism and the ongoing colonialism in Canada, but also that how that translates to actually legislation on the land. Uh, and so we co-wrote this document. And uh, I, I know that Peter was uh, a hand in the transconceptual section uh, as a performance artist. Um, I think he often thinks through this way of um, shifting in and out uh, of a performance kind of space and a performance perhaps persona. But uh, I recently underwent this process with the manifesto where I was translating it into my language, into Suhwamukshin with uh, elders Flora Sampson and language teacher Janice Dickbilly. And so we got to this section on, you know, what you just quoted, the transconceptual space. And it was challenging to translate this, uh, except for when we got to the end, where we're never settling like the flow of a river. Uh, it was easier to translate that part. And in the end, I thought it was such a good exercise for me because um, some of that art speak just, you know, it just um, wasn't really translatable, but the real essence of it uh, in terms of this way of relating to the land was something that was, you know, was quite easy um, to translate. And so, you know, even in that manifesto, it's written in English and there's ways in which I, I'm learning um, by doing something like this process of translation um, within community, which also was a way of uh, supporting the local language society of which there are several in my community. And I'm so um, grateful always to those people who um, do the hard work of language revitalization in our communities. Uh, and so, yeah, this, um, this manifesto was a way to uh, create space and, and place and intention um, through just um, just naming the the space um, and so yeah it's meant to be shifting and it's meant to be uh, unsettled and uh, and moving and in mm. flux um, that includes I kind of oh do, do you no, want to finish your sentence yeah only that includes the way I talk about it as in it shifts over time <laughs> yeah I I would like to go back to this notion of shifting because I feel like even as we talk about code switching and moving in and out of institutions, it feels like um, a state that many of us operate within. Um, Tamsin, I'd love to hear from you kind of around this, this role of shifting and being a Māori artist and arts worker on Indigenous lands that are not your own. Um, I feel like that alone is a is a very nourishing and and complex thing mm. let alone um mixing and operating within settler structures um that's not a question but i'd, I'd love to hear from <laughs> you about <laughs> about your experience and yeah yeah i guess like um i move i've worked predominantly in like really white parkier spaces um, mum's Māori and dad's Pākehā Irish. 
So we kind of grew up between two cultures a lot. Um, and I think um, it's really obvious to me um, the privilege I have being my age compared to mom and dad. Um, I guess I did really feel at home in artist run spaces. And I have to say that, like, even though I was the only Indigenous person in all of them, um, I felt like I could be myself and um, I just really like talking about art. I really like um, the conversations we had and we kind of built a lot of trust in the group. And moving into, and then I decided that um, you kind of hit a ceiling with these spaces where um, you can kind of say the same thing in all these different ways. Um, but if nobody's listening, then nobody's listening. Um, and so I decided to move, to, I really wanted to work at Footscray Community Arts. Um, I feel like, one huge difference is they really truly position themselves. And um, and I guess we say what we represent, which I felt like was really different to where I had previously worked. Um, and I always think like, you just look around the room, you know, like look around the room and um, if you can't see yourself reflected, then I think that's a real problem. Um, and so that's been a real, uh, I guess like a relief for me to kind of look around the room and see like all different kinds of people um, to kind of feel like I belong to a space, but then also I feel really respected there. Um, and I think the way that they treat their staff is totally in line with what they represent. So it's a lot to do with people. And I think kind of taking, like thinking about that, um, I do think that more park here run space as well. I actually love them. Um, I think, it's really important to listen to others and make room for other people because it just makes for better artwork, to be honest. Like, um, I really wanna see exciting shows and I wanna hear from like lots of different kinds of people. And um, while that was like a very uh, productive and like quite a generous space, like with TCB in particular, um, yeah, it's controversial in um, TCB as a gallery but from my own personal perspective, I felt really um, like I learned a lot and we had some pretty fraught conversations, but it was kind of um, within the group. So I feel like you need to develop trust between each other. Um, and that kind of goes with your friends and your peers and like your Fano. like um, it's so important to listen to each other and build trust. Cause I feel like that is real change. Not these kind of like broader institutional models I feel like you you look into yourself and you change yourself. Um, and in order to do that, you need to be around lots of different kinds of people. Um, so yeah, I feel really privileged to work at Footscray Community Arts. I've learned a lot. I feel like it's really pushed me out of this more like contemporary art framework. And I've had to consider lots of things like what it means to be blind, what it means to be deaf looking at art, um, what it means to be Aboriginal what it means to be Māori, you know? And I think I could have needed that. Um, yeah, so I feel like what's great community arts is in a really interesting and like really quite magical space. Um, and I guess I'd really encourage other artists run spaces and arts institutions to, to I guess, like look within themselves um, because it's just boring hearing from one kind of person, to be honest, you know? Um, and I think there's so much more that we, it, I feel like in a broader sense and in a more political sense, um, we need to find ways to communicate. Um, and I'm interested in that, how we can do that. Mm. Yeah, and it, there's a lot of failure. It's quite stressful, um, but I feel quite proud too of the work that I do. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Tamsin. Um, I kind of want to jump ahead into this um, conversation about communication uh, and hear from you Vanessa Kwan around um, I was really taken by we'll talk about artist run space in a second but um, this period over the last 10 years of um, people jumping into the conversation about decolonize diversify oh shit we've got to include people because uh, we haven't um, and the, the pressure to make overnight reform of, um, as Tanya has highlighted, the very stark reality of um, 
this this corrosive homogeneity of, of whiteness that exists in the art and of and of sameness. Um, what have you learned working at Grant Gallery from from your predecessor Glenn? And yeah, I'd I'd love to hear you speak more about um, you in the in the past practice session you wrote it's very disorienting to have sudden interest in decolonial futures when this doesn't happen overnight um right yeah um yeah okay yeah it's such a big question and i just want to say i'm just really enjoying hearing uh tanya you speak about bush and then uh Tamsin and how you're kind of orienting yourself within footscray because i have you know a little bit of connection to both those organizations just mostly just knowing of you know and I just I, I, I love hearing your, your personal kind of like investment in what those those places represent in different ways and um, I do also have a, a real investment in what grant is and what grant does and I think um, I mean I'm in a I mean I, I feel consider myself quite lucky in the position that I'm in I've worked at grant for um, going on eight years now I was uh, five years in a position of um, as a curator and then uh, the last two and a half years I've been the program director and um, as Vanessa mentioned I took over from my predecessor Gwen Altin, um, who was there for since 1984 so uh, he, he was there for 35 years um, actually 37 by the time I think he retired so in some ways it's like one of those things is like it's usually a horror show when you have a founder who stayed for so long but actually I, I want to give a lot of props to Glenn um, and to all the people that worked with Glenn over the years um, for having created an organization that I do think is quite unique in the cultural landscape. Um, and I think there's a, there's a lot of different reasons and I think it is, it's no one vision, but it is, I think if I was to say that there was anything that um, one of the things I really tried to learn from Glenn was that this idea of being non-proprietary. And um, he- Could you unpack to, that a little further? Sure, yeah. I mean, he used to speak about this idea of like, you don't own anything like you are kind of like facilitating things and so um in some ways like it's it's a really hard thing to put your finger on because like so many things we have words that become co-opted and then become used but actually if you think about what the concept is it's like so difficult to maintain a non-proprietary approach to art because our currency is in like putting a name on something and kind of owning it, you know? And that is true of artist run centers too. We try and kind of like, what's our brand? What do we look like? What do we like? How are we kind of come together as an identity? What do we mean? What's our role? Like, what can we say we started? You know, like there's those kinds of like um, desires to like sort of plant a flag, you know, which I think is sort of endemic in the culture that we are, you know, all living in. And one of the things about Grant, and this has to do with kind of how it came together and how it evolved is it was always a place for kind of a bunch of weirdos to be. So in the eighties, it was the place where people who didn't feel like they had a place to be could be. And then that evolved. And then there was a relationship, a very close relationship with uh, performance art and outsider artists and indigenous contemporary artists. And over time that kind of gained as a, it, it, it changed and evolved because the community around Grunt, around Grunt started to feel at home in that space. And so if you look at our stuff, like, and I used to think this as like a young artist coming to Grunt, I was like, God, it just looks so messy. Like what's going on over there? <laughs> and like, actually now that I've been at Grunt for like eight years, I'm like, that is the best thing about it is there was never any attempt to like pull it all into one thing. And I think it, uh, I think, and this is just me sort of like having my own perspective on this, it kind of like allowed for, for a certain kind of um, uh, freedom and agency for people to come in and do the work they needed to do. And to some degree, and this is where this sort of like sticks to my own kind of philosophy around what we do is like to bring yourself to your work, to bring your whole self to your work if you can. And that requires a lot of work on your own self, but it also requires work on the part of the organization to accept you and to give you space. And so I think that um, that is what I've experienced at Grunt. It hasn't been perfect. It is by no means perfect, but there is something in the way that it kind of came together um, and has evolved that has allowed for, I hope, a future that also contains that kind of sense of, of the non-proprietary. Um, and I, I, yeah, and I also think that there's a lot about it that is about kind of the distribution of resources versus the kind of like hoarding of resources. And that I think is something that I think we can kind of um, align with more with artist run centers in general, or that there is a different kind of perspective on what we do with, with our money, because we're not necessarily collecting institutions. Um, 
anyways, I've probably gotten far, far away from your initial question, Vanessa, but, um, Not at all. but yeah. I mean, I guess in terms of like this particular moment, you know, there's, there is this sudden turn towards like what I think people are calling a kind of decolonization of the institution. And it is a bit disorienting for, um, for organizations. And I think for those folks who have worked a long time um, in this field to be like, oh, okay, now we have to do this. And it, but, but it's like, there's an urgency to it now that I think is, um, is a little inhuman. So I think that's, that's, I think there's some suffering going on because of that kind of that time scale and that expectation, that desire, um, but I'll just leave it there. Yeah, um, I, I'm quite interested in, in unpacking this understanding of ownership and non-ownership as well as this distribution of resources, both feel um, quite, um, I think many, many cultures around the world have share um, and that this, that being a particular strength um, that artists run spaces have adopted as well. Um, what I'm hearing from you is this defining and building an ability to be in relationship with other communities. Um, and I, yeah, was, was interested in returning to this idea of, um, you'd mentioned before that, that relationships take time and that trust takes time. Um, and so the forced nature sometimes of um, feeling like you need to make changes overnight can, can begin to feel quite rushed and quite, um, quite an outside metric. Do you wanna talk a little bit more about how you have built a relationship with Grunt and Grunt has built a relationship with others. You've, you've mentioned it a little bit, but I'd love to hear more. Yeah, sure. I mean, I don't know if I could, yeah, I mean, relationships, yes. Um, well, I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure we have a, all have a lot to kind of say about this idea of how you build relationship and trust over time. And I think it is something that um, maybe as we speak, I'm trying to figure out like, what is the relationship to kind of the unruly bodies that we have and then the unruly bodies of an organization and how do we find a home there? And um, it's so particular. I think it's, it's amazing for me to see this moment where so many arts organizations are imploding because of dis, dysfunction and dissatisfaction. And it's a, it's a really tough time as a real moment of reckoning, at least where we are. Um, and questions of equity are really coming to the fore. And it's hard to, within all of this kind of like noise, kind of understand what it is that allows you to have a home within an institution. And um, yeah, I mean, I do feel like it has, it has to do with, God, I don't know, Tanya and Tamsin, I feel like we need to like collaborate on this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Even, even what you were saying about, um, that people have unruly bodies and, and that these organizations are themselves unruly bodies. Um, it feels like it relates to Tanya, what you were saying, um, kind of about, about the, the creation of Bush Gallery and that being a continuing process and that feeling like the, the ways that it has been described within that manifesto um, as being really rooted in a physical self. Tamsin also jump on if, if you've got um, stuff to say. I'll let, I'll let Tamsin go. I'll just add that, um, yeah, I mean, I'm all for the unruly. It's kind of where I've situated things, but, and uh, I don't want to go too far down the grunt gallery, like appreciation and love I have for that <laughs> organization. Um, only, you know, uh, grunt introduced me uh, early on to a group of Aboriginal artists from the Bumali Collective. And so when Vanessa kind of talks about this urgency now um, for people to be looking at their organizations and equity, I think it can be quite telling that urgency because it indicates that you haven't had a longstanding relationship, mm -hmm. whereas Grunt has. Uh, and I think this urgency and anxiety comes from a kind of, um, uh, you can identify it as a kind of way to stay on trend uh, and, and that should be a, a bit of a flag uh, already, um, that desire to grab it quickly, um, because it is a longer time frame. Uh, and usually places that have done it are really happy to share 
what the ways in which they have done so and to have space of collaboration. But if you're just wanting to be at the top of the trend, you're not um, yep. asking people. And I'm cutting out a little oh. bit, Tanya. Could I get you to repeat um, maybe the last two sentences? No, I'll, I'll pass. Okay. I'll, I'll pass it over to Tamsin only, only to say, you know, it's not a, it's not a trend. It's a, mm -hmm. you know, you'd have to have a longer. And Tamsin, I'd, not to just throw you in for the loop, but I'd love to hear about, um, I think as, as Tanya mentions, that these things have become buzzwords recently and this co-opting and, co and as you describe it, this colonization of language. Yeah, I mean, like, I guess for myself, I can only speak for myself being Māori, especially living on Aboriginal land and I would never speak for Aboriginal people, but I feel like they've taught me a lot and I'm so grateful for that. Um, I'm less interested in any kind of urgency. I mean, this is our lives and we've been doing this for a long time. And I think about like, who is, this, who is asking the question and who is it for? And I don't feel like I'm asking the question and I don't feel like it's for me. Um, and so I feel like that's a very colonial, very Pākehā way of framing relationships. Um, and I think I kind of personally had to pivot, um, I guess my own self instead of answering to that and then letting that go and um, celebrating what it means to be Māori. Like we're very like sophisticated culture. Um, I feel like lots of Pākehā could learn from us. I feel like Aboriginal culture is really sophisticated too. And so I didn't really feel like it's my job to convince Pākehā people of that anymore, but I did try to do that for a long time. Um, and I think that was my own kind of like um, colonized self. Uh, and I think being a little bit older and also having siblings and also talking to my close friends, um, I want to celebrate who we are um, and what we have to offer. I mean, I, I got back into Aotearoa, like, like I was saying before, um, really luckily at the beginning of this year to see Toy 2, Toy Order. Um, and that was really, um, it had like a profound effect on me living here mm -hmm. because I think we always respond to a very colonial Pākehā way of being Māori. But I was like, what does it mean to be te ao Māori, like live in a Māori world? And so I guess I'm less tolerant of trying to answer questions and more kind of want to step into a space of um, celebration and healing and joy. Um, and I think in order to do that, you need to surround yourself with people that understand what you're trying to do. Otherwise you can spend your whole life this like weird convincing and it's, it's so tight that, and it, um, yeah, you can't, it, your wairua and your switch is spirit gets diminished and for what, you know? Um, and so, yeah, so I think I learned that heaps from my mom. Um, and then also other, um, other people like, or, like not even just, uh, Manawahine or other Māori people but just um, yeah how like black women situate themselves and yeah I want to kind of step into this idea of um, celebrating what it means to be us instead of feeling like we're being deficit framed by the media and by the government because we've always been here and it's our land um, and so and there's lots that Pākehā could learn from us so yeah so I think like that's helped me a lot um, Kind of letting go of that feeling of responsibility yeah there's, there's a reframing i think that you were speaking to um one that center that that centers yourself and, and your your joy and your people's joy as opposed to um the the outcome and and, and priorities of 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 wider structures um yeah, and I think like um, time for Māori is circular, like how we were talking before. Um, and so there's no rush, like, <laughs> like for us, like, um, and I feel like the only people that are rushing are Pākehā and I think that's um, kind of, yeah, I don't know. Like I think um, this, I'd like to get to know lots of different kinds of people and hear from them and like see their artwork and um, learn from them while we're kind of here and in the time we're here because it will kind of like circle around again. Yeah, I, I was taken by um, yeah, how you introduced that concept of, of time as a circle and even the relief I felt it gave me. Um, mm, that's cool. 
that these things come around and that, um, yeah, not everything needs to be solved tomorrow. I think what, what I've heard from you all and kind of the sense that I got is that you're all in it for the long game um, and to see yourself and your community triumph. Is that a correct uh, read? <laughs> Maybe, maybe the only thing is like, like to show that we are currently in a state of, you know what I mean? To not mm -hmm. that we're going to get to this stage, but that actually yeah. just reframing what that success and triumph is, you know, for me, it's a huge triumph that I've learned so much more of my language in the last 10 years and my kids speak so much more, you know? Um, so there's just different ways in which my triumphs are um, shared or, <laughs> mm -hmm something but yeah you know I agree I just think it's I just put it into the into the present absolutely present circular moment um Vanessa do you have any thoughts on what Tamsin shared yeah um yeah many thoughts um yeah I uh yeah what am I trying to say yeah there's I think it's a it's a really interesting moment to try and figure out who, who is the beneficiary of your work and your life. And it should be you. And that's not only you as in like, I want, but like, who are you related to? Who are you accountable to? Who are your people? And it took me, it has taken, it's still taking me a long time to sort of identify within myself who those people are and who those communities are. And I think I'm getting clearer about it, but it's taken me my whole career. It's been 20, over 20 years of working in the arts and trying to work, or, you know, like working in the arts to, to uplift, you know, racialized uh, queer artists in the world. And, and, and like, I don't say that as like a flex. I say that as just like, oh, this is just what I was doing. But I, for a lot of those years, I thought, I thought I was in the service of a different thing. I thought I was in the service of like a kind of success or a kind of like, I don't know, like something else. I don't know what I was in the service of, but it wasn't, it wasn't ultimately those things that I am deeply connected to and to those people who I'm deeply connected to, because I think I was always trying to be like, like a kind of more, um, whatever, for lack of more nuanced word, like a kind of like white cis hetero thing, you know, like that's, that's what I thought was the point. And it, and it, it's, it's really not. And I'm just delighted to not really care about that right now. <laughs> yeah, I feel, I, mean, like, I feel you, BK. Yeah. I like, it's such a great point. Like, I don't know, it's life's, this, this kind of like short life is, um, you have to choose like how you want to situate yourself. And I feel like that is the political position to like celebrate who you are and like not answer to anyone. Um, yeah, so yeah, I totally agree. It's nice to hear with that point of view. Yeah, and I think I'll just um, echo that. And I think that that is a lot of the background to this project idea that I have that I enact mm -hmm. in the gallery is just really being able to do that in a way um, that is centered um, more so like that. You know, I have my kids, uh, it was easier to um, be a parent, it was easier to be an artist and a curator and blur all those lines. Um, to grow things on my land and then also to learn about plants and language it was just much easier to do that under this totally different um proposition than than trying to find ways to always fit it into the existing way i was operating as a curator um though i will say that um you know artist run centers were were usually the most open places um for that exploration for sure um but mm. not without without their tensions as well you know yeah yeah I think it can be tough to I feel like I'm still at the start of my journey um and it can be tough to wade through some of this stuff that that I will it will probably get easier with age but um well, a line I loved from the manifesto is that bush gallery includes dogs um I thought that was really wonderful and, and clearly showed um your own biases but um yeah, a, a really welcome way of welcoming animals and humans alike and, and not necessarily seeing um, 
one over the other. Yeah. And it's going, to, oh, break, what were you yeah, going to say? I was just going to say, it's trying to break down that space that can be so, you know, um, specific of the gallery, you know, whereas you go to community, there's kids running around, there's dogs, there's things happening, there's family, there's inconvenience, but there's great times things come together, you know, and I just wanted a better sense of that than the way that the compartmentalization that happens within the gallery, which, you know, still has um, a place sometimes, you know, I, I do, I am in usually pointing out that it's not a um, complete binary as in like, I totally reject the gallery. I just, um, I just like to make my own, you know, rules and my own space and a way in which I'm not constantly negotiating all these big questions we have and these tensions we face. Um, and that empowers me to continue to do those things when I'm in those kinds of spaces, but to have a space where I can locate and situate myself in, uh, in something more connected and joyful and fun. Mm, I love the multiplicity of that, um, that you can still belong to, to organizations that have specific space and specific systems and, and you can also have, have your own spaces that help support and, and supplement you and, and give you life and joy. Um, going to the conversation more like focusing more on artist run spaces. Um, I see them as they, as they can kind of be a double-edged sword in that um, there is a huge amount of people power and goodwill. Um, they are generally more flexible to change and more quick to adopt change. Um, and they are also still sometimes beholden to the same power structures. They are often resource poor. Um, they're, they're not outside of the canon that we talk about. I, what to you are the possibilities presented within these spaces that larger institutions may not possess or couldn't initiate um, fast enough? And, and yeah. Can I jump to you, VK? Um, previously, you had said, I think there are a lot of ways in which artist run culture is uniquely situated to absorb and disseminate alternative ways of perceiving the future and alternative economic space and housing solutions. Whoa, I said that. <laughs> I was so impressed when you said that. Like, Damn. <laughs> I was really feeling it that day, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I do, like, I think that artists get, um, people tend to think that artist value is in sort of like creating nice things for people to enjoy, you know? And I think it, I think it really um, loses out on what I think the true potential of artist and artist culture is and like an equitable artist culture is, which is to actually come up with solutions to, to our bigger problems right now. You know, like I think there are, there are ways in which artists have been super functional in creating alternative economic realities or actually more functional mutual aid societies or like off grid, you know, residencies, you know, like there's so many things that artists are kind of proposing as like a future and people just think, oh, but you make sculptures, right? And we'll put them in this gallery. And it's like, that's actually not the point. Like we're kind of missing it. And so I do feel like I, I'm so uh, excited by research and practices that are kind of engaging with this greater question of what artists and culture bearers have to offer as kind of like architects of our future. And I think what um, indigenous and racialized and queer artists have to offer as architects, or maybe architects is the wrong word, but as kind of uh, people looking to the future with a new way of, of building things. And um, there was this like study that I kind of have been referring referring to it was like kind of a rapid fire paper that was created uh, late last year by um, it was funded by grant makers in the arts in the states and a couple of artists actually put it together in four months and it was kind of basically around the solidarity economy and how artists were functional in creating like multiple frameworks for understanding like how to support one another in economically sustainable ways in like housing and investing and arts and culture and mutual aid, like it, it, it's really, it, it's incredibly exciting to think about that as the potential. And so as 
artist-run centers, I think that we are in a position to recognize that a little bit more and to to do that, I guess, code switching um, to like to lift up these practices so that we can actually give them the space and time that they deserve. Because I do feel like many institutions, larger institutions, specifically collecting institutions, um, have a harder time kind of envisioning our practices expanding beyond those um, those currencies, you know? So I do really feel like world building is the thing. And I'm, I'm just like, that's what I think artist run centers can help do or be mm -hmm. functional in. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I feel you have so much hope in the, in the possibilities that are, are present. Um, Tamsin, I, I mean, you are. Oh. oh, sorry. No, I'm. You, no, you go. <laughs> no, you go. <laughs> I was just gonna say, half the time, I'm deeply unhopeful, but like, I, I feel like these are the things that I have to hold on to, or else I can't get up and do my job. You know. Mm. Terms, and you've you've worked for, as you said, a decade, um, in artist-run spaces, working with them and alongside them. Um, have you got anything to add to this conversation around uh, where art spaces are situated? Um, and, you know, there's, I think the conversation that often happens is like, should we go to be more grassroots? Should we institutionalize for more funding? Where, where should we go? Yeah, sorry, I think my internet's kind of cutting in and out. But can you hear me? All good? I can hear you now. Oh, cool, awesome. Um, yeah, well, I guess like, I think when I think about artist-run spaces, I don't see them as being separate from other things. So bigger institutions directly feed into artist-run spaces, for example, art schools. Um, mm -hmm. And art schools is a part of a university. Um, I taught at Monash University and I could really see that like, um, it's very colonial. Um, and then it kind of feeds into, it would feed into um, what we would show. And, and I think, um, I do feel like institutions need to take accountability and responsibility um, because it's a network. So it's rather than a hierarchy, I feel like everything kind of feeds into each other. Um, and um, I do think that universities uphold um, what you know like colonial really repressive um infrastructures and what it means to make art i guess i'm really interested um in that time where art schools join universities and how it kind of shifted um and how it's become and i guess like how funding has become um very singular so i guess um to answer your question in a very convoluted way um i think with my experience of artists on spaces, I think it's a network and people, um, especially, um, I guess, like publicly funded institutions and then also universities um, need to take responsibility for what they put into the world um, in order for artists run spaces to function too. Yeah, so I think we're not separate, artists run spaces are not separate, but I also feel like kind of what um, VK was saying they provide a lot of hope because like, you know, like I felt really at home there because it's like a bunch of freaks like trying their best to like communicate. <laughs> and that, I, and I love that, I feel like. And so I guess, um, yeah, I think it's, it's about individuals kind of looking into themselves and like addressing their internal racism and like addressing like um, the colonial because colonization, like it's a project. I mean, it's never stopped. We, mm -hmm. we navigate it every day. Um, and I think to uphold that, really, I think people really need to ask themselves why they're doing that and how, um, yeah. And I think that's like an internal shift rather than like an external kind of like sermon vibe. Yeah, so I, I guess like my hope for artist-run spaces is that they remain independent from funding bodies but then also independent from universities. And um, I hope that institutions turn around and show better art and create better courses. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Love that, Weedle. Um, I feel, I think what I am taking out of what you've just said um, 
is, is to acknowledge um, the settler structure, the colonial settler structure of many of these larger institutions and how they to feed into art spaces and that, um, yeah, the, these are not separate conversations. Um, and I think your, your wider view of how these networks feed into each other um, is, a really important analysis. We can we can tend to pigeonhole this is this thing and this is this other, um, but the fact that they all sit in relation. Um, Tanya, have you got anything to add to this conversation? Um, gosh, yeah. I, I mean, it makes me recall a series of talks that were given uh, under the Pacific Artist Run Center Society. Um, institutions by artists, which was this series of um, a symposium, I guess, of uh, really uh, artists who, um, you know, artist run centers, but also institutions that were quite divergent from an artist run center model um, that mm -hmm. uh, artists had created. And I still continue to look back at it because it's a really great. Um, chronicle of the different ways that artists were envisioning um, some kind of organization in terms of how they might come together. So this desire to come together to connect and to share through art, uh, I think can be seen across all of those examples. Uh, and you know, and I have a great love for artist run center uh, culture. Uh, and it's not completely um, innocent in these same tensions and, and um, you know, challenges uh, that we have. But at the same time, I find like always being the counter to that um, really a difficult place. I don't wanna always be the one giving the critique. The critique is important, but it's really difficult to occupy the space to be like the person who's pointing things out. And I think this is another reason I just had to pivot I don't always want to be the person saying like, that's, you know, I, I don't like what you're doing there. And here is some background about colonization you might want to pay attention to. Um, you know, the, there needs to be obviously not only indigenous or racialized people who have that conversation, who are the ones to point those things out. Um, because that can be a really difficult position to occupy. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, but, you know, but artists imagine all kinds of uh, and racialized artists and queer artists and indigenous artists and black artists included, um, you know, imagine all kinds of radical ways of working that are endlessly uh, inspiring and uh, that motivate me to be able to be like, yeah, okay, I can do something different. I can just make the space and like bring people together who can come together. Um, and we can we can do something different because artists have set this great model for us to do so. Uh, and I just, um, but you're right in that we don't have the resources often to um, carry those great ideas through. And then um, they can be co-opted by institutions or they can be given lip service by them. And um, I was laughing, Tamsin, because I left sort of like curatorial work across different kinds of galleries and centers. And in, and then instead I went into like teaching at the university. Yeah. <laughs> it's a much more fraught like space, but, yeah. um, but there, uh, you know, that's around because, you know, part of that is just a very um, real situation of precarity, you know? I worked for many years as a freelance independent curator doing a show with indigenous artists as a gig for a couple thousand bucks. Um, and at that time was never really offered a permanent job. <laughs> yeah. And it gave me some flexibility as a parent and everything, but it's also, we still in the art sector don't really do um, a good job of supporting people with families or who have caretaking responsibilities. And we make all kinds of sacrifices to be flexible, to be able to be in the jobs we're in, but not everybody um, can do that and have to make choices 
um, for more stable employment. And so, you know, it's that tension you're talking about, like it's this fantastic um, place of imagination and, um, and criticality and excitement and experimentation. And then, and then where do we go to sustain that? It's like activist culture too, right? It's like, yeah. you're fired up and you have energy and you want to change. And then at times we don't have the capacity to sustain that because we're not the ones with the resources, you know? Yeah. yeah I, I, I hate, yeah. Oh, what were you going to say times up? I'm just going to respond to Tanya, like um, talking about teaching and kind of how it feels, feeds into artist run spaces. Um, and then also like this idea of money and like getting paid for things. I mean, often the best things come out of no money and like no resources. But then I also feel like it's very difficult to live that way. If you've got a family, you need to pay your bills, like you need to pay the rent. Um, and so, yeah, it is, it's about um, people kind of sitting down a bit and like listening that I feel like we could kind of shift those resources a bit more. Um, and I do, yeah, feel like universities should take accountability um, because I believe that education should be free. Um, and I also think that like artists run spaces, <laughs> artists run spaces uh -huh. offer that and they fill in these weird gaps and it's all volunteer run. So I don't know, I think like we have like in Australia, it's very wealthy, like a, a mega economy. And I think um, I, I'm interested in people taking accountability in the spaces they work um, to shift that power structure. Um, because it's very limiting and we can kind of see it collapsing in on itself, like this idea of casual work, um, mm. work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally feel you, Tanya. <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing a lot of inaccessibility and, and this tension. Um, I, I'm really, um, my imagination is really captured, VK, by um, yourself painting the story of, of artists not necessarily as a collective but what it looks like when they when we all work together um and this incredible thing that happens where like solutions become made um and new possibilities emerge um while holding at the same time that these spaces and the way that the gig economy is set up um that many people are barred from entry from from being part of these conversations who would really who we would really benefit from hearing from um, i'm aware that we have about seven minutes more of chatting before we um, move to uh, some questions from the audience so i just want to go back to that responsibility um, that you spoke about tanya um, of being frustrated, always feeling like being the person to point things out. Um, and I think to me that feels like um, another red flag when the responsibility is put on the people who are the most um, affected to also be their own advocates and to, to, be, to, to be holding a host of roles. Um, and I guess from my perspective, sometimes you are, you, you take on that responsibility because you are aware of um, how few resources there are available for marginalized people, both within your, your community and other communities. Um, going back to what you said, VK, I often feel like I'm oscillating between this utopian hope and this deep dread. Um, these feelings of hopelessness and paralysis of loneliness and scarcity. Um, and I think it can really hurt our spirits. We can tap out, we can feel very exhausted um, because it feels like you're the, you're one of a few people as opposed to being one of many. Um, what methods of co coping have you found helpful in continuing the advocacy? And I think this conversation is very similar to activist circles and continuing to make art and to keep on making space. Who wants to go me? first? <laughs> oh. <laughs> One of us, yeah. <laughs> 
Oh gosh, I don't know. I'm just uh, keep on keeping on kind of, uh, <laughs> I think like, well, not entirely that, you know, I continue to be inspired by artists, artwork, um, the kind of um, uh, impossible imagination of the future. Uh, and, you know, and for me, you know, my kids and um, thinking about ways in which um, their future could be better and their grandchildren and their, you know, children after that. So, uh, you know, and then I have great colleagues and people to be in conversation with and who I can look to and be like, okay, you know, yes, there are maybe not as many of us as, um, as I would like, but um, the, the ones that are there, pack in some punches, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so I and it's affirming to see that because then I see somebody else doing that work I go like hey, I do try to do that and I value that in that person so I can then allow myself to value myself you know um, in terms of just seeing the good work that people uh, are doing and that's that's uplifting totally I think like for me um uh, I think about our ancestors a lot, um, my Māori ancestors and like what they went through. And also I guess like my immediate family, like my mama, like my Māori grandmother and then my mom to give me the life that I have. And then that always makes me feel really hopeful because there's so much work that's been done to get to this point. Um, and then I think about, yeah, like my nieces and like my brothers and sisters and what kind of life I want them to have um, because yeah, this trauma is generational and I feel like I work really hard to um, heal from that and heal our family from that, but through art, um, which I think is a really powerful tool. Um, yeah, so I actually genuinely feel really hopeful. I think it's a really strange time. I mean, and um, we had an earthquake this morning. There's like some really crazy protests. We've been in lockdown for like a million, like 230 days, something insane. Um, but I also think like, our apocalypse has been and um, here we are and also we're thriving like um, and I, I guess like I'm really inspired by someone like Nigel Burrell who was really who curated Toy 2 Toy Order um, who yeah really kind of like stood his ground um, and didn't compromise for Pakia. and so yeah this and then also just like music and art and there's so many great things in the world and um, yeah, I feel really privileged and grateful to have the life that I do. Yeah, I think I would echo both those things, you know, like I think it really is for me. Um, I spend a lot of days feeling really, really stressed and hopeless and upset. And then when I can find like a spaciousness, it's usually when I recognize um, yeah, those people around me or those things around me that are that are that are there and already doing the work and the 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 idea that the the thing we need is already here you know whether it's in community it's between us it's with ancestors it's with the people that we um have can create joy with like i actually do think sometimes it's that simple of checking back into that and um it just, it makes me think of the work of, of someone I did want to kind of mention, and I will, I will pop mm -hmm. her name in the chat. Um, uh, and it's, I'm going to send that out. It's uh, Mijan Tobias, who's uh, an oral historian who's working in, um, in the States. And she just did this, this beautiful residency with the Kennedy Center. And her project is to um, interview artists and cultural workers, mostly indigenous and black cultural workers, and talk to them about resilience and talk to them about what keeps them going. And she just did this incredible series of, of talks, which is like her research. And they would range through a bunch of topics, but a lot of them were around like, what keeps you going? What is your dream for the future? Like, and I have to say, just listening to those was uh, hugely inspiring. And it actually gave me a lot of relief because it was like, the work is being done. People are out there and they just, they, we are, uh, we're part of that. And I think one of the things about Mijan is that she actually also talks about this in this thing, this flow that happens between people and you just lock into this thing and you're having like, you're telling your story and you know, it's so simple, but it's so, so transformative. And ultimately that is what we're here to do, you know, is to, is to do that for people with people. And the more we lose sight of it, I think the more hopeless we get. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, VK. Um, 
I was going to ask what your vision of the future is, but we have run out of time. So let's show that one. <laughs> um, yeah, moving on to a Q and A um, before we wrap up. Um, and I do just want to give myself pause to let those words that you just said settle in my head. Um, yeah, there, there was there's just some really wonderful answers being shared. Um, this, okay, I'm going to scroll for one second. Um, okay. This question by an anonymous attendee. Um, I accidentally clicked answer live. I don't know what that does. Um, so there are two questions here. Um, one from Elizabeth Brown around how the Academy art historian specifically best can best support the work of decentering and de-westernizing art spaces. Um, is there a role that the Academy could be playing in the space of artist run spaces that is not happening? Um, being asked as a white woman who is a doctoral student in the Department of Art, Art History and Visual Studies in North Carolina, um, which is a historically white college. So how can the Academy art historians specifically best support the work of decentering and de-westernizing art spaces? That is the focus of this conversation. I'll just quickly say, I mean, I'm constantly into the lesser known art historical, right? So like um, chronicling and teaching and archiving contributions um, uh, by artists. Um, you know, there, there are so many who haven't had their, uh, you know, right kind of um, moment in the light and that it's so exciting, those histories. So um, I certainly try to do that. I don't teach an art history, but I certainly try to do that in terms of um, contemporary artists and introducing students to um, expanding their ideas of art practice and um, the many amazing Black, Indigenous, you know, people of color, racialized, queer, art, trans artists out there. Totally, and I'd echo what you were saying, Tanya, where I feel like um, like really like understand the curriculum that you're teaching and the implications of what you're saying. I, I taught ice tree for a while um, and I had to stop because I felt like I was just kind of um, teaching the Western canon, which is what I learned in art school and had to unlearn. And then I was like, what does it mean to be me doing this? And so I feel like um, to take responsibility for um, what you're teaching and understand the land that you're on and the people you know, like the custodians of the land and respond to that because a lot of the time you'll have students in the class um, that might feel unsafe or um, they don't feel seen, but you're a guest on their land. So yeah, I'd really encourage like any academic to really go through your curriculum and make sure that there's lots of views. Um, yeah, that encompasses lots of views and lots of different kinds of artworks. Um, and yeah, and like, I guess like sit down and um, hear from others and, and yeah, like refrain from kind of like centering yourself in the conversation, like as I guess like a white woman or like a white man. I think the other quick thing I add, I was thinking uh, aloud, I was thinking about this is that um, it also, it, that involves risk taking. Like I, I sometimes don't get very good um, student teacher <laughs> reviews or whatever because um, literally students who are non-racialized will be like, I don't understand how this, uh, how, how I'm expected to relate to this because it's a, an artist who's non-white. So like you're, and hopefully they build on that, but I'm just saying like, you have to take risks because, um, you know, the students, uh, can also be, um, a component of people who don't want change. They want to learn Western art histories, some of them, and we have to be the ones to expand their view. Thank you. Um, I may leave it here because we've got five more minutes and I, um, just want to, yeah, sit with the conversation that we've just had and, and have a moment to absorb what has been shared. Um, thank you, Tanya, Vanessa and Tamsin for your time um, with myself and, and with the group today. I learned so much from um, 
each one of you when, when you speak, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, I'm going to pass to Seb and Marnie in a minute to kind of do the official wrapping up, but um, kwa mutu ngā kōrero i tēnei wā nō reira e te manuhiri i e ngā iwi aku mihi ki a koutou katoa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Um, essentially what I said was uh, that wraps up this conversation at this particular time. No doubt there will be many more conversations down the track, but um, to the visitors and the people here, um, th thank you very much for joining us. Um, can I please pass to Mani or Seb? Um, Absolutely. Thanks everyone, Vanessa, Tanya, Tamsin and VK for this incredible space that you've created and um, in particular to you Vanessa for holding that space. It's been a, a lovely session and um, I absolutely need to go back and, and hear the recordings again. So we hope that everybody will revisit these conversations, take some time for reflection and also join us across the next four sessions. Um, tomorrow, hosted by Andy Butler at West Space, we have session two called Working in Place, Cultural Perspectives and Responses to the Complexity of Gentrification. So um, a very important conversation as well with speakers, Elisabetta Heta, Keg de Souza, Silen Palay, and Tuat Tanat Sis Weiss. And apologies if I've um, uh, misspoken uh, that name, but I believe that this will be also a very wonderful, critical and generous conversation. So many thanks to you all, stay safe and um, keep being creative. We'll see you tomorrow.